everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast. And today I'm joined by writer John Gerard Fagan, the author of Fishtown. Hello, John. How are you doing, Alistair? I'm well. It's good to see you. Um, you too. So first of all, let's talk about Fishtown. Um, how do you describe it to people? Because it's an unusual book. Uh-huh. Uh, well, it is a memoir. It's, um, it's a story about someone who couldn't really get much work in Scotland and decides to leave their life and go over to Japan. So that's the crux of the story, and it has myself in it. Uh, well, that it's only, a real story. That only barely <laughs> scratches the surface of it. Like, you're absolutely right, and uh, it's quite interesting, we should say to uh, um, listeners, that you and I met trying to get work in Glasgow after I Yeah, that's after. true. And the job that we had was full of people in the same boat, wasn't it? It was folk who had either recently or not long ago graduated from university and there was just seemed to be no work out there apart from subtitling for telly. That's true, yeah. That's, that was one of the things, like, those contracts for... They kept rolling over, like, month after month. Oh, we might get you permanent, we might not. And they kept going and I was like, I can't plan my life around this. So um, that kind of situation, was that what sparked this idea to go and look for something else. Because I do kind of remember you saying you had an interview, I think it was through in Edinburgh, with, uh, to, to kind of go to Japan, is that right? That is correct, yeah. Um, yeah, it was one of the things I was like, I don't know if that job was going to go permanent or not, I couldn't wait any longer. And if it didn't, then I would be like back to the start again. So yeah, one thing was I just, before that I applied for Japan, it took a couple of months. And as I was doing the subtitling, then it came through as I was on lunch. I got a text message saying, you've been accepted. So I was like, okay. And then I just went, all right, I'm going for it. And I mind telling you yeah. the day that I'm going to Japan and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> nope, you're lunch mate. How do you manage to talk that out for lunch mate? But sometimes, uh, yeah, uh, that, that'll focus the mind on doing it. Um, is it right you kind of, not not blagged your interview, but you went with a kind of little bit of Japanese to kind of, you know, make them think you had more, perhaps? Oh, definitely. I like, memorised, like, a self-introduction and a couple of words, the um, little reply words, like, so does nay, I mean, so that, is that right? Like, stuff like that. So they were speaking to me in Japanese. I could just kind of blag it if I didn't know. And I worked out great. The wee lady thought I was fluent and that was that. So I was like, yeah. So the, 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 the memoir itself, as you say, it's kind of written, I would explain it as kind of free verse. Each chapter, if you like, is either a page or not much more than a page. Why decide to write it that way? Or was that just what felt natural? Yeah, so I wrote it on my phone to start with. As, um, so I don't really know what the length is going to be, but I just wanted like, the heart of each situation, like strip it all back and just make a wee note like what happened then and then take it from there. Um, I did, after it, try and write out like the first opening as normal paragraphs, a normal story, but it didn't really work for me. But I thought, oh, am I going to have to write all of this? This is going to be a pain in the arse. Yeah. If I do, because I kind of liked the style and I thought this is different. Not that I was trying to do something different with it, but I just thought it kind of suits like the story, you just want little snippets, bam, 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 it's fast paced. And um, yeah, it, is, it is like free verse. I didn't say out, I'm going to write poetry because I don't see it as poetry at all, it's not. Um, so it just kind of fell that way, and that's that. I think it does suit it for a few reasons. One, it feels like what you experienced was a bit of an assault on the senses all mm. around. You know, you were thrown into this completely different, almost alien culture, and therefore, Yes, you, you get from each chapter, it's like, um, you know, almost like, well, there's one punch, there's the second punch, you know, the next thing comes along very quickly afterwards. Is that what it felt like? Oh, definitely. That's, that sums up perfectly. Yeah, it was an assault on the senses. You get there and it's like so many different things are happening and you're completely in chaos and you don't know what's going on and you're trying to ground yourself in some way and the next thing happens and the next thing happens and it's like, and I thought, at the very least, I'm going to have the work that I was doing, that's going to be the easiest part. And that wasn't, like, that was, like, one of the most difficult things to do there. Like, uh, especially I didn't expect negative reactions from people that didn't need to do that. Didn't, there was no reason for them to be negative about it. 
So that's like kind of took me out again. I was like, it's like getting punched everywhere. Like, hey, okay, so what do I do next? What kind of, did you have expectations and kind of how was the reality as opposed to the expectations? Because you were teaching, I should say that that's what your job was. Uh-huh. So uh, I thought I was going to be teaching creative writing mainly, like in Tokyo, in a school. So I knew it was going to be a school, but I thought it'd be a school. I thought there'd be a much higher level of English. And I had all these kind of lessons in my head of what I was going to do. All the different things that and I like, thought this planned all out beforehand. I thought this would be, as I said, the easiest part to do. And then it was completely different. It's like you're not going to Tokyo. You're in a tiny little fishing village. Hardly anyone speaks any English. Good luck. <laughs> and that was that. So it's like, okay, just need to, like rebrand everything that I thought I was going to do there and just start from the beginning again. And uh, yeah, and like it says at the start of the book, they, as soon as they heard my accent, the teacher's yeah. like, oh, you're not American. And I was like, uh-huh. And they're like, oh no, this is not going to work for us. So I think so, like, okay, this is a great start. Do you know what I mean? But so I on, believe we're... that American English was what they wanted and American experience was what they were looking for. That's mainly what they're used to. Like the guy that I replaced at the school, he was American and he got on really well with the head of English. And they like done team teaching together. I think the, the, the teacher of English, the Japanese teacher of English, he went over to America once. So he was just like embellish his experience. Another guy would back him up and then we'd do like random American sort of lessons. Like American English is fine to like teach because it's easier. Mm-hmm. You've got less layers and yeah, um, it's more like baby English. If you're going like from a professional point of view. So uh, it wasn't difficult to do that. But uh, they wanted, or he wanted specifically an American experience for the kids and for himself to make him look better. But I was like alien to that. But baseball was the first thing. So, like, I must have less on baseball and I was like, I've never seen it. You know, so where did we go for here? <laughs> did they have an idea of where Scotland was did, did, at all? Most of them just thought it was part of England. So just like Igirisu, and that just means like the UK, the issues down for England. So when I said, no, it's not England, it's a little bit different. We've got much different culture, much different politics and all these sort of things. And uh, some were really interested and some of the teachers really embraced that and it was good. And uh, some that wanted the American one thought, oh, wait a minute here. I know America, I know the UK. This is completely alien to me. So I don't want to seem like an idiot towards other students if I don't know. So again, they would just like shun you in a way, but that's that's part of going out there and putting yourself there and just seeing what happens. You can't expect everyone's going to be nice and they've all got their own agendas, do you know what I mean? So So first of all, and you're talking about Fishtown being a small uh, what's the name of the village? I can't remember now, but Yaizu. Right, you. So is, yes, yes. would you say there's a Scottish equivalent, roughly, without wanting to, you know, give anyone a bad name, but small fishing village? Oh, yeah. It's probably something up north, if you went way up north, like Peterhead or something like that, something even smaller than that. Yeah. Maybe up somewhere in, like, the Shetlands. Something so, like that. What was the expectation of um, what you had to teach? Because I'm... T- Without getting ahead of ourselves, you know, Tokyo mm-hmm. doesn't want it. But what what did you feel that your expectations, their expectations were different as well? What they thought they would get from you? Yeah. Um, so they thought, well, every English teacher had a different idea of what they wanted. Some just wanted you to read from the book. So they give you a textbook and say, read that out, but in an American accent. Right. And that's it. And then just back them up. They would try some grammar point on the board and they'd be like, is that right? And you'd be like, aye, right, okay. That's how just like to make themselves look good in front of the kids. And other ones would just be like, the good ones would be like, do what you want. And uh, and I'll just chime in, see if it works for them, if what they don't understand and stuff like that. So some, I would be able to do some like, uh, short stories and they could write that out because in Japan, it's more like, this is the right answer. This is how we do things. So when it came to, like, write a story, for example, they're like, but what's the right answer? What kind of story do you want me to write? And it's like, anything you want. 
they, yeah. they take they get taken aback. So a lot of especially when they're younger, it's very structured for them, so they're not given that creativity. So coming in with that, I thought I'd be able to do that before I came. I realised it's not going to work for everybody. So there's a mix. There's a mix in it. Is creativity in a child almost seen as something dangerous then, or something that might be as aversive? Or yeah. Just, they want to get the best marks. Well, as as like the little uh, exam factories sort of thing. Right. It's like we're all leading up, and this is the right answer. So, if your creativity is out with what they expect from you, like for example, I write in the book when they're done a drawing class, when the teacher decided that the best idea would be for all the kids to draw me, because they hadn't really seen westerners before, so they get a good look at me and they could all draw me. But all the drawings were almost identical. There was no really difference in them. So it was like, all right, it was like an anime character. And uh, at the end of that chapter, it's like the nail that sticks out gets hit on the head. And that's like a Japanese proverb. So it's like there's something. I mean, there is, once you get to the older, like at universities, there is creativity and that is encouraged, is encouraged in business and stuff. But when they're younger, they are very regimented because it is just the way it is. You know? uh, and did you have um, kind of fixed ideas of what Japanese society would be like and how were they confounded or did you not have, were you just going there with an the open mind? I was going with an open mind, but um, I thought they'd be very respectful and they would be caring for their elderly because that's what they're famous for and they're famous for being clean and all these things, but uh, and there is like a, a standard of the culture that that is correct. There's also it's just 127 million people, they're all completely different. Yeah, yeah, of course. So it's like, you find that a lot of people are dirty and they're like, and loud and they don't fit that stereotype. So that's just, that's good in a way. It's like, if they're not just like replicas of each other, so. Yeah, because throughout the book, um, there's certain times your kind of frustration is palpable at the way not just you're being treated, but at some of the things that you view around you. And I wondered if that came from thinking, well, uh, that doesn't fit my idea, or it doesn't matter where that happened, that would be offensive. Yeah, there's there is things like that, even little things as well. Like, for example, I was in a rush um, at the train station, and I gave the guy the money, but his job is he takes the money he gets the card he points this is where you're going to go this is where you are this is how long it's going to take and then he stamps it and then he says okay and then he makes sure and it's like a a little like role play does yeah. and I'm like, i don't care about that stuff i'm running for you know the trains there i'm running for it but he, he doesn't care about that it's like i'm still going to do my wee routine and you're just so frustrating sometimes it's like can you stop just just be a human not like that way so and uh, yeah, a lot of the shops, the when you go into a shop, they scream "Irashaimase," which is like welcome. Even if it's like six in the morning, you're just going in to get your breakfast. They'll scream at you, and you're like, "I know you have to do that, but you don't have to do it all the time." It's like so those things that just are there, they get on your nerves. <laughs> but what's there. interesting is you get frustrated with yourself as well. You know, at times you think, "Well, I'm not as fit as I would like to be," or uh, mm -hmm. you know. I've missed that because of I'm hungover or for certain things like that. So, I mean, how difficult was it, I suppose, to live how you wanted to in a foreign land? As I think you have to really change um, yourself. You have to fit in, yeah, definitely. Especially when you go to a little place, you have to change your diet. You have to, like Japanese, um, if you're 10 minutes early, you're late. Yeah. So you have to change all these things. You can't just... Uh, do what you want you have to fit in with the society that's something a lot of people are not willing to do but if you don't do that you're not it's not going to work for you so that was a thing that i didn't i knew would maybe happen but i didn't really think so much about like but even it, uh -huh. even like going to a, a shop to buy clothes extra clothes are all too small for me yeah. it's like oh, i didn't even think about these things so it's like, if your initial expectation was going to tokyo where i'm presuming there are more Western uh, uh, things that we would recognize perhaps than, you know, going to somewhere. I mean, I've done it in Spain. I've gone to small towns in Spain where 
people, you know, there's, it's very, very different than going to Madrid or going to Barcelona. Um, so yeah, that I can imagine that that adjustment would have been quite a difficult one to take because it's not just done then one leap. It's kind of you know jumping twice into not just going into a new culture but going deep, deep into a new culture. Yeah, that's true. Like yeah, when I thought I was going to Tokyo, I thought it'd be a lot easier, and I could. I know they've got all the Western press jumps and stuff, but then going to the little fishing town, it was like okay, there's nothing. This um. It's going to fit that here, so I just need to change. The first, I liked sushi before I went to Japan, but I went there and tried it really authentic. Like everything was completely raw and there was like moving octopus and stuff on your rice and stuff. I was like, I can't eat this. But uh, you have to adjust when I got this school, like lunch as well. Yeah. It was like little fish with all their bones and their eyes and stuff. And it's like, that's your lunch. Are you going to eat it or not? So you're like, right. You either eat it or you, you starve, that's the, and that's the thing that's going on. Yeah. There's a few, well, there's lots of memorable bits in it, but there's a few I've picked out just to, I think, give, give people a kind of idea. First one is when you were uh, at the school, there was an obsession with the song We Are The World. Yeah. You know, uh, which was the USA, um, the world, uh, you know, their equivalent of Band-Aid, wasn't it, basically? Uh. But this was much, much later, and there was still this obsession with We Are The World. They didn't really update their curriculum, so it's like, in all their books, and I, mean, they, I never heard that song before when I got there. I was like, I knew, I probably knew of it when I was younger, but just, it wasn't fresh in my head, and they were singing We Are The World. They put it on, it's like, oh, this old video for the 80s, and I was like, why this song? And there's just a whole unit on it, about how it was great and all this, and they all love Stevie Wonder and stuff, and it's like, this is weird, this is like, 30 years later. <laughs> it really is weird. It's like a, something you would get from a time capsule and then discuss it. But to think that, I mean, you know, it, it's probably the message that, um, you know, kept people kept teaching it. But it just struck out at me as what an odd thing to be kind of obsessed by and bring out every year. Yeah, there was a few of these things. I was just like one of the songs that the other ones are just really outdated things that but Michael Jackson was still massive. The, talked about him as if he was like still the number one current artist and he'd been long dead so it was as well as that uh, well, something else you did over there was you started to play football again and I found the bits mm -hmm. about football etiquette very funny apart from anything <laughs> else because you like I would be you know running about shouting everyone man on all that stuff what are you doing all that kind of stuff and then uh -huh. that, was, that was frowned upon to say the least and you played to quite a high level as well yeah, like the first game was the Emperor's Cup, which is like their Scottish Cup. And uh, we get told, you win this game, we're playing Yokohama Marinos. And so I was like, this is going to be great. It's like, got myself into the best like shape fitness-wise I'd ever been. I was running every single day before it. And it's like, so I thought this is going to be good. I thought, that's a dream. I'm going to Japan, I'm going to play against Shinsuke Nakamura. I thought, I can't believe this is going to be great. And yeah, and getting there, and it was just the atmosphere is very calm and very respectful. You know, um, but it was big stakes. I was thinking, what's going on here? Just like they would, they would shut up a wee bit, but the tactics were just an, uh, the first game I'm playing with them, and they put me up. They do like the Japanese national tactics. Most of the teams will just follow whatever the national team's doing. Right. So it was a uh, one up front, four two three one. And the, the tactics boy just said, we're just going to kick the ball at you. I was like, all right, fine, but how's this going to work in terms of like the communication, the rest of the team and stuff like that? So just like, hoof. And it'd be like three guys on me and like ex pros and stuff, or guys for Brazil that are all like proper footballers, not me. That's played, for, like, only played like five and seven a side sort of thing for years. So it was like, it's going, I was getting into the stride yet, but yeah, yeah. they weren't. They weren't liking me shouting and screaming and motivating the team. I was motivating them. Try to come on. Yeah, no, I know like, exactly. You would. I just, I, I was just thinking about comparing it to the Scottish juniors scene, and it seemed like <laughs> the opposite of that. And did you get knocked at one point after playing really well because they felt it was culturally you were doing the wrong thing? Perhaps. So I, it was half time. Like they took me off first game. It was nil nil, and we're doing great. Like we're bossing this team 
And once it was like they were giving the balls, holding it up fine, getting in play, I was finding out how the team were playing, we're getting the wingers involved, and it was doing good. And it takes me off, just like, I'll just calm down. So I was like, I was like, oh. it was, it was like I'm just watching the team, and then you just get those new tactics, and you just get smashed, and it's like 4 0. I was like, it was the point that then the next game was just like a normal league game, and I just wasn't as motivated. I was like, oh, that was, they had, it wasn't that better. There was a team that was a division above us. They weren't that much better, though. They weren't that interested. I felt like a bit more enthusiasm. Yeah. It been fine. But the next game, I was more quiet and I got any of the, the form. But then, yeah, I was just like, I was messing myself up as well. So. It was so interesting because, you know, people often say, oh, football is the global game and, you know, you could meet anyone from any country and a ball goes down. And it's true. It's, I mean, it's true in a way, but it's interesting to hear how even there with that game, you know, no, there's certain ways that you do things and there's certain ways that you behave. Um, yeah, like, uh, uh -huh. so just the last one, that the, like, if you lose the game, then you go, you bow to all the fans and then you've got to go around just like, it's like a, the other team get to leave and then the losing team go down to like respectful, we're sorry we lost everybody. So that was kind of, I, I like that. Do you know, that's, the, there are things about the Japanese game that were kind of cool that way. Aye. Imagine yeah. that in an old firm game. <laughs> you would do it, So the other thing which did tickle me was there was a, a, a girl, I think, from quite a poor family and she was kind of sleeping in the nurse's bit and then she kind of, took a shine to you and would often kind of um, uh, hang about you. And then she wound you up a cracker. Um, you explain that, that because that made me laugh out loud. Yeah, like, she was a lovely wee girl, but uh, she wasn't interested in going to classes. And obviously, how you teach her didn't work with the style in the school. She would be, she's like, she's the one that threw her lunch out the window once as well. Let's get courage, so I don't want curry out the window goes. Uh, but she decided to like teach me some Japanese that would be her mission. And she taught me, show me your tits <laughs> in Japanese. And uh, and she was loving it under a clue, but I was just like, what she was saying, she was saying something that meant something respectful. Uh -huh. And then she was like, go tell like the wee cleaning lady, uh, your new Japanese. So she called her over and over and I said this and she was like, but she always like knew that, because she was in a fat laugh, but she was on the floor laughing. I was like, I'm going to get fired for that. <laughs> well, I kind of thought that when I read it. I went, oh, hang on a minute. If they're looking for an excuse to get rid of them, then uh, this this could be the perfect opportunity. Yeah, but that was the that was a, another school. It wasn't the mountain school. That was a different one. So they were they were fine. They knew she, what she was up to. In that. Just, right, okay. I think they were. I think even they were happy that she was like doing something. That she was communicating. She was like, like she was motivated a wee bit. So. That was fine. Uh, even well, before that, it was good. You were moved kind of from school to school, weren't you? I mean, and, and uh, th but this was before you went to Tokyo, is that right? Yeah, in the, the fish town, I got four schools. So some of them had been for one month, some had been for three months, some had just, it was a random schedule they just done that they moved you about them. So, yeah. yeah. And what kind of time period are we talking here? For those before you moved on? So I was in Fishtown for two years, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then I moved thinking again, I'm going to Tokyo. And then I didn't, I get put in Shisui. Which is kind of the far suburbs. Is that how you do explain it? I mean, Tokyo's huge, so the far suburbs is... It's, it's not in Tokyo, it's, um, it's in Chiba. No, right. it's in Chiba. So like, but it's like, they say it's near Tokyo for Tokyo Airport, Narita Airport, which is an hour and a half away from Tokyo. So, like, so this was, Presswick is near Presswick is Glasgow Airport or Glasgow Presswick or something like that. But exactly. Exactly. It's like saying you're in Millport, but you're meant to be in Glasgow and you're not like that way. So, um, that was even worse. That was like, that was mad. That was just rice fields and there was less things about. I thought Fish Town was bad. That was like. Oh, this is mental, and that was my upgrade. <laughs> so, yeah. But no. in, that, in that terms, how was it seen as an upgrade? Did they see it as an upgrade rather than yourself, or was it a better job or something like that? Yeah, this was senior high school, and I got a special needs school as well. So it was like, 
and Chiba is obviously a massive big city, so it was in Chiba City, Kenzo, that region. So these, these scenes an upgrade, I thought, at the start, but I was near Tokyo this time, so, and uh, it was going to be higher English, like right. a level, so I thought I can kind of do more things that I wanted to do first coming here, so, yeah, it was like that. So whereabouts were you when you got involved in music? Was it Far Beyond Demise? That was the band's name, yeah. Uh, I was in Fishtown with that. That was my second year there. And how did yeah. that come about? Uh, I was in the pub in Hamamatsu and uh, just drinking at the bar. And then a big guy from Paraguay, the two of them, big massive guys, muscles, long hair, just like, said to me, are you in a band? And I was like, no, I'm just out here. And they're like, well, oh, we've just lost our singer. Your singer moved to Osaka. And they're like, do you want an audition for it? And I was like, what kind of music is it? They said it was like metal music. And I was like, I've never screen sing before. But I'd done like before acoustic gigs and piano gigs and stuff like that. So I thought, why right, I'm here. If it was in Glasgow, I'd have been like, eh, no, I'm all right. But here I thought, do you know what? I'll get a chance. I like that music. I don't know if I can do it, but I'm going to find out. So I went, aye. And then we went to a karaoke bar. That's the tradition, but karaoke. And they flung on some songs and then go. So I just went, just went for it. I learned, I looked on YouTube. I was like, how do you scream sing? How do you prepare your voice? And like practiced that and like went down to the docks and just in my car. Uh -huh. And then it's, it's kind of, once you get used to it, it's, it took me about a month and then it was fine. It was like, so just do this thing. Just scream, especially when you're having the kind of time you're having. It must have been great. It must have do you been know what? It was, it was actually, yeah, it was um, just like from normal thing to actually right from your diaphragm to get this, the, the power and the noise you can get out that I'd never done before. It's like that is really therapeutic. It just takes everything out of you and you do feel like a sense of endorphins trying to calm your body down after some stuff. Like, I didn't think of that way, but you're right. I, that probably helped a lot. Another clash of cultures which jumped out to me was when you were asked to be Santa. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was when I was in Shizui and uh, coming Christmas, they're like, do you want to be Santa for a little like kindergarten out there? And I was like, all right, because I was staying in Japan. I wasn't, most people were going home. And he said, when you're looking for like a white man to be Santa for them, um, and we'll pay you this amount of money. So it's a 500 pound. I was like, that sounds easy. And definitely yeah, I could do with the money. So yeah. And that was just like, it was madness. Like, from start to finish. <laughs> but do you want me to tell the story? Well, I mean, it's how much you want to tell, because I don't want to give anything away. Maybe it's best leaving people to read the book about it. But uh, yeah, as you say, it was a kind of, um, a, it wasn't the organised queue for the grotto that you might get uh, over here. No, look, I'd done Santa for my mum's nursery, right? Just turn up, you've got the costume, you wave to the kids, you give out some presents, and that's it. And it's like that way, and that's what I expect. Right? This is easy. That's just like... Or just like talk to them, what do you want for Christmas? Have you been a good boy or a good girl? That sort of thing. And this was a show that we're putting on. So it was just like, it was completely, oh, here we go, this is very Japanese version of what they think this should be. And uh, yeah, straight off, you know, like the soup is up to here, or not even that one, it's up to there. And I was like, no beard. And I was like, oh, they expect me to turn up a white beard. <laughs> Oh, right. I was like 30 at the time, so I was like, come on. But, oh, that's been Just nice. another great, you know, because we have a very, that's clearly idea of uh, of Santa Claus and going along with the, you know, the we are the world, it's just that those kind of culture clashes, which are unexpected, and there's clearly a story diff behind them are, are you know, they, they are... Uh, jump out at you when you when you read the book but let's let's move on to then time in Tokyo because to me that was the closest you got to maybe settling down in Japan or even thinking about it yeah that was once like it's always had in my mind I want to get to Tokyo if I don't go to Tokyo when I'm here then I feel that like I missed out so when I did get there 
eventually it was that I thought I was settling down and I had a girlfriend, we had a wee cat, I had an apartment, I took out a lease for two years and um, yeah, and I got the job at the university. I always wanted, so I was letting everything was going well, I was starting to make good money and I was letting, I was having a good life. So I thought, yeah, this is, there was no point of doing anything different at the time. So that was, that's what I thought, this is a life that I was hoping for. Yeah before I came and that's why a lot of people some people don't ever get there and they leave and some people do and that's why they stay for a long time because it always seemed to me like the early days were doing your time I'm sure it wasn't uh, um, supposed to be like that but you know as you say a lot and you mention it in the book a lot of people go over and some almost come back straight away some keep going for a while, but then realise it's not what they wanted. But but you did kind of uh, stick it out. Was was that always your aim then, that you thought, if I move from job to job, eventually I might just get to where I want to be? I never really thought it that way. I didn't think at the start I would get a university job there because it was so complicated. Right. Um, I didn't put a time frame on myself. When I got to Fishtown, I thought, I'd be lucky to last the summer here. Like, and that would be a nice fee. But most people think this would be a nice wee crazy experience and I'll go back home. But then think I was thinking, but what if I got back home? Nothing. I've literally gave everything up to come here. So I'm not willing to just go back and be like, ah, oh, it didn't work out. Yeah. I'm yeah. saying I'm going to make it work out. So I just kept going. And then once I was driving like four hours a day, yeah. going to the different schools, I was like, I've had enough of this. I'll go give the university a try and see, chance my luck. And uh I got lucky, and that was that. Following up on that point, how did your time in Japan make you view back home? Did it change the way you viewed home? Um, I suppose I adopted a lot of or some Japanese ways of thinking, like timekeeping, for example. Like, uh, I'm completely with the Japanese. I love being early. I like that thing. Don't waste other people's time. Don't If you don't respect them, then you're going to be late. If you respect that person, you should value their time as much as your own. So I like that. So I went back home and people are late. I'm like, you're late for? What's going on? So that sort of thing would change. Um, yeah, um, I suppose my diet completely changed twice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like first I got into the Japanese way of eating, then afterwards I went full vegan. I just like thinking about it a lot. So it was that coming back, I was completely different with that. And, um, but not, football wise, definitely not. I don't like the Japanese way of doing it. <laughs> I like shouting and I go back, yeah, I go back playing my pals and stuff that and we're all screaming at each other and laughing at each other. It's like, this is what a game should be. We're so, all being, we're really. Without giving anything away, John, why did you decide it was time to come home? There was a lot of mitigating factors, so to speak, that decided for me, I've been out here for going on seven years now. If I don't move now, I'm going to be a lifer, like a lot of people. Yeah. They say after five years, it's going to be really difficult going back home. And it was, it's like, you've now re-established yourself in a new country. You've got all new friends out there. You've got a new way of life. You've got a place where you live, everything you have is out in a new country. So it's more difficult every single year. And I was like, if you look, what the book says, like my parents are getting older, my brother and sisters and my friends that are back home are having families and I'm not even meeting any of them or not. I'm just, yeah. I'm just drifting away in my own little world. So I thought at some point I'm going to have to make the decision what life do I want? Do I want to have a life? back home or am I going to keep this life in Japan and develop it and it's it's one that a lot of people have to decide out there and some people if they have got a Japanese partner and then they get married and they've got kids it's far too difficult to come back mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so and, and, that. and now that you are back and looking back on uh, Fishtown the book as well have you changed uh the way that you think about your time in Japan? Do you look upon it with greater fondness? Because for a lot of the stuff in the book is quite visceral, you know, it's quite um, heartfelt. It's very much, I think, of the time you wrote it, how you felt. Have you changed anything about how you view Japan and your time there? 
I suppose when you look back, you always think of the good times as well. And uh, that's when I'm talking about memories. But with the book, I did write a lot more things about the good things. Yeah. Like the different spending time with your friends, going on trips up the mountains and all that. But it just like it was boring. It was like, it was boring. It was like, it was good for me. Yeah. Like, but then for MDL reading it, it's like, who cares about it? You had a lovely night out and or you climbed a mountain and it was great. It's like, nobody cares about these things. They want the real experience. And I thought, yeah. And when I wrote it at the start, the, yeah, the darker things come to the surface straight away. They come, but when I'm reflecting back now, yeah. Uh, do I see it with rose tinted glasses? Maybe, I, I think the more I'm here, I do. It's like, yeah. people say like, oh, should I go to Japan and stuff? I'm like, oh, yeah. And all the good things will come out first. Yeah, so I think that's what's good about Fish Down, that I do have a record. You give them a copy everything. of the book and say, well, if you want to know the truth about it, read that. And that'll be the yeah, book. there's you know, it's good and bad. It's like, it's for everything. There is good and bad for everything, but because it's such a different culture from our own, and because, like, my journey wasn't plain sailing at all, it was mental, uh, makes for a good wee story and Absolutely. that people can learn from it. No, it's a terrific book. And going back to the way it's written, did you have um, any influences on the way it was written or was it really just down to the that physical way it was written on your phone? So that kept things short. Because there's a quote at the front from uh, Kerouac and it kind of mm. reminded me of that almost stream of consciousness way of writing. Yeah, well, yeah, Kerouac and Bukowski and writers like that have got very succinct, don't really waste too many words with their stories. I think, yeah, I like that writing. It's that did influence and did play in my mind when I was writing the story. But um, yeah, it is kind of like stream of consciousness in a way, just like whatever comes out. It's not that heavily edited either. No, no. It's just like, that's exactly how it came out. There wasn't that many changes that I made or the cuts made either, so. Yeah, I think that's what makes it so vibrant to read, as you can tell, this is absolutely how you felt at that time, uh, written down. Um, have you thought about what you might write next? Have you got any ideas or have you, have you not at that stage yet? I've wrote hundreds since uh, <laughs> Fish Town. Yeah, I'm constantly doing it. Uh, I finished a new book um, that I was writing when I was living in Fish Town. I started it there. So that one I'm pitching just now um, to agents and stuff. That's Because um, when I seen people there, like the little fishermen that lived there, and they lived by themselves and they lived in like my apartment block and they just lived these little lonely lives as well as I was living mine. But they're like, that's their world. Mm -hmm. they're, learning, they're earning little money in a little factory. They don't speak to anyone. They're just coming back home. And so it was like, I wondered like, if we set this a little bit in the future, and Japan's population is still dropping and everyone's migrating towards the cities, what's it going to be like for a little fisherman in Yaizu, there's not many people about and there's like a dying fishing industry. So I went for there and made it like a Crusoe-esque sort of book. Excellent. So, oh, well, I hope yeah. uh, we get to read that soon, John. Oh, we are copy. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, listen, John, thanks very much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks, Alistair. And we will be back soon with someone completely different. Mm -hmm.